Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Yeah. Uh, over spring break, I emailed you about rescheduling my exam. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I emailed you on there pretty much as easy. Do okay. this is a good time to decide we could take it and try to again. Uh, yeah. You can email uh, but if you're available next to the next day, not yet. Sorry, a Friday. Friday is an anniversary. It's not as free on the table. At 12. Yes, yeah. A week from today. Okay. I'll, I'll email you. Okay. Thank you. Um, eventually, I All right, I'm going to get started since we're on time. Uh, yeah, so... <clears throat> 
what is this? What's going on here? Oh yeah. So yesterday I had a exam review. I gave you a lot of hints on what to study. I tried to be somewhat explicit on what to focus on because there's actually a lot of material. Um, uh, and it's easy to go down the rabbit's nest or whatever. Uh, so just make sure you cover your bases. And then if you want to deepen any knowledge, then the a lot of this, like I tried to allude to, involves just practice. The concepts, especially when it comes to op amps, are very simple, but it's got to get comfortable applying those concepts and you'll be fine. Um, what else is there to say? Yeah, the, the ordering of the questions is slightly different from what I said, but but the actual questions are exactly what I told you during the review session. And I posted the list in the right space of one through 10, the flavor of questions you should be expecting. The, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about the exam. Yeah, so Saturday is a very important do day in Purdue because uh, all of you will be studying all day. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't really follow sports, but, but my wife went to NC State for undergrad, so now I gotta, I gotta go for Purdue because it's just gotta be <laughs> just... <laughs> Otherwise, I would just be like, I hope they lose. But no, no, I'm like, I hope they win. <laughs> All right. But anyway, um, I hope you have a good weekend. The exam is not till Thursday, so you can probably take Saturday off. I don't know. I'm not going to invite you on how you schedule your time. But um, I will say, you know, if you do things responsibly, you should be able to have some fun. And I would, these kinds of things don't happen every day. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to recap, re recap, we've been talking about this little transistor device. And physically, the way it looks is like this. Um, in your circuit diagrams, it looks like this. And in particular, we kind of, the let's say it's one. Uh, yeah. So in particular, we said that the current comes in through the drain for the end type. Uh, if this thing is kind of turned on so that there is this channel that has formed, the ID will travel through and then it will come out of the source. In the circuit diagram, it actually looks like this. So that current going from here down to here actually is this current here, which we call ID. <laughs> so the current that flows through this branch should be the same as the current that flows through this branch. Additionally, we, uh, well, I, I don't think I said this during class, but when we build these, with these transistors, there is a uh, insulating layer between the gate and the end type. So this is basically something that keeps current from going through. So you can think of it as like a, yeah, just an insulator. So what that means is that the current coming into the gate will always be zero. So in our circuit diagram, IG will always be zero. And uh, we, in particular, talked yesterday about how changing this VGS changes the, the resistance profile or the, the, the width of the gate mathematically and how it affects the amount of current that can go through this transistor. So we looked at all those IV relationships yesterday and uh, and effectively we just uh, basically plugged in our VGS into a formula and then that formula tells us what the ID is. Sorry, VGS and, VI and VDS. Today, we're gonna actually kind of stop thinking about the simplified version of the device and actually start talking about how this device behaves in circuits. 
so now we've kind of developed the IV relationships. Now we're going to actually try to build things with it. And uh, we're going to cover kind of two simple circuits. This is what's called the DC biasing circuit. DC bias circuit. And you can think of this circuit as pow just powering your MOS device. Um, so at this point, what? we got an eye. OK. Uh, I'm just powering up your MOS device. So it's not really that interesting. It's just basically, uh, how do you wire up this circuit so that it has the ID that you would like and the VGS that you would like? Now, this, the role of these two resistors here is a voltage divider. And so by controlling RG1 and RG2, you can control the voltage at the gate. Additionally, once you know what the voltage at the gate is, you can control ID by changing this other resistance. And then uh, same thing here. So effectively, this is just a way, by choosing these four resistances, we can basically get any response that this device can give us. Um, so effectively, this is just a circuit way of implementing this. Why do we want to do it? Because later we're going to look at amplifiers, and then the amplifiers will require some kind of uh, DC level operation. And so to get that DC level operation, we're just going to use this four resistor network. So this is just kind of uh, the beginning of studying amplifiers. We're also going to look at current sources, but uh, we'll talk more about that towards the end of this lecture. So just as a reminder, there's only two types of transistors, even though the book tells you there's four. And then within these two types of transistors, there's two subtypes, enhancement and depletion. Depletion means that it's normally on, so that's why it's got the extra thick channel. And the voltage, the threshold voltage will be what distinguishes from the enhancement mode. So the mathematics remains the same, except the voltage that you were gonna plug into these inequalities, VTH, is different sign whether you are in a, in depletion or enhancement mode. So nothing changes mathematically. You don't even have to think about it. You just do the same math for NMOS, PMOS, depletion, and enhancement. You just gotta know that at the end of the day, the V threshold is gonna be a different sign. So, so that's gonna change how these inequalities behave. Additionally, from PMOS and NMOS, it's, it's like basically like a mirror world where all of these inequalities are the same. So if you look here, all of the, all of the entries are the same. The only thing that changes is the, uh, the direction of the inequality. So for to be in cutoff in NMOS is that VGS is less than V threshold. For PMOS is VGS is greater than V threshold. For triode, VGS is uh, greater than V threshold for NMOS, less than V threshold for PMOS, and so on and so on. So I specifically made this table uh, to arrange the data in a way that it's very clear to you that how all of these things are related. Effectively, if you memorize these, all you got to do is flip all the signs and then you know these. Once you know how to handle enhancement mode, you know how to handle depletion mode because it's the same thing. So effectively, if you know the NMOS and you know how these things are related, that's all you need to know how to analyze. OK, so why do we have these three regions? Well, depending on the region of operation, the current ID will be defined differently mathematically. And yesterday, we dwelled into these relationships. So in particular, if you're at cutoff, you're just not going to get any current. So cutoff just means that you're off, like that the transistor is off. Not uh, super interesting. If you're at triode region, the transistor will the current will increase linear well almost almost linearly as vds there's this quadratic term that is actually typically small 
unless you read you're close to saturation. Um, and effectively, the the slope of that increase as you increase VDS depends on K, which is a parameter of the transistor, and VDS sat, which is actually just VGS minus V threshold. So effectively, the value of VGS controls the slope of that VDS. So you can almost think of this as, if we ignore this term, um, you could almost think of VGS as controlling the resistance that this VDS sees. So basically, uh, you can think of this as a conductance times a voltage equals a current, and but this conductance is dependent on VGS. So if you make your VGS very small, the effective resistance is zero, sorry, infinite, and so you're gonna basically not get any current, whereas if you make it very big for the case of in magnitude, then you're gonna have a very small resistance and so you can get more current and then the slope will increase. And that's why when we looked at those plots, we saw that when VGS uh, decreased, the slope also increased, sorry, when EGS increased, the slope also increased. Um, so this was VDS and this is ID. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna kind of recap. Now we're gonna get into the more interesting thing, which is solving circuits with these things. And uh, so I'm gonna first tell you the general strategy, and then we're gonna basically solve some circuits. So one thing is that because these are nonlinear devices or they have different regions of operations, um, we are going to have to do it by process of elimination effectively. We're gonna start by assuming that our circuit is in saturation, which automatically that gives us one equation, which is that ID equals K over two VGS minus VTH squared. Remember this is actually uh, VD, what we call VDS sat. Um, there is another term here, one plus lambda, whatever. When you're doing DC analysis of any transistor circuit, at least in this class, and for the most part, if you're doing this by hand, if you're not using some SPI software, you're going to assume that lambda is zero. And so you're just gonna ignore these effects. These effects are actually only important when we look at the amplifier circuits where we're actually trying to amplify a signal and that lambda actually has a significant uh, contribution. But for the DC analysis, it's the effects that it would have are negligible. I think in the homework, they make you do one with lambda non-zero. And it, the whole point of the problem is just to show you that it's like a 10,000th of a correction and it just makes your analysis more complicated for no reason. So for DC analysis, we just do, 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 do. Starting Monday, we're actually going to partially look at this term, not really, and, and I'll explain more of that later. So we're gonna derive some equivalent circuit models and for that, we're gonna use this term. I like to put it in the equation so that you, you know that I like, uh, so that it has everything already in there and I don't have to later tell you like, just kidding, this was wrong. Uh, but when you're doing DC analysis, you just kind of ignore that thing. Okay, so we're gonna assume it's in that saturation. And what that tells us, that gives us already one equation, which is how ID is related to VGS. And we get a nice property here, which is that ID is not related to VDS because we're in saturation. So it's not, so it doesn't matter what VDS is. If you're in saturation, it's not related. Uh, this, this function here does not have a VDS. It has VDS sat, which is VGS minus V threshold and not dependent on VDS. Okay, so now that we have this ID, we actually have enough equations to solve the circuit. So we're just gonna solve the circuit and I'm gonna go through some examples. And then what you will do once you solve the circuit, you're just gonna look to see whether you meet your saturation condition, which 
The saturation conditions are two, that V, G, uh, for, for an N MOS, sorry. So this is for N MOS. VGS is greater than V threshold, and that VGS minus V threshold, or VDS sat, is uh, less than VDS, or equal, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Actually, let's not put the equality because it's better. Okay. Now, let's say that this wasn't an NMOS and this was a PMOS, how would the inequalities change? Or what would change? Yeah, so if this is a PMOS, it's just, doot, doot, doot. that's it. Nothing else changes. The math is all the same. The conditions are different. And basically what's gonna happen is that when you are dealing with an NMOS, uh, BGS, VDS, all of these quantities will be positive when you're not a cutoff. When you're dealing with a PMOS, they will most likely be negative. Uh, of course, if you're in depletion mode, you know, it, it can be positive, but uh, in general, it's kind of like a mirror world. So NMOS, you're in positive world. PMOS, you're in negativity, basically. Uh, okay, so here less than, so, whoa, 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 okay. So we're still in the NMOS, and then this is an NMOS, so this has to be greater. One way to remember this is that in saturation, so as you increase VDS, as we learned last time, the current increases, the current increases. So if I keep increasing this VDS, the current keeps increasing, keeps increasing, keeps increasing, hey, Eventually you like basically fill up that channel and then you keep increasing that VDS and nothing happens. It's like a it, it's like a highway during rush hour. Like at some point you fill up the three lanes and uh, it doesn't matter how many cars want to go through there, no more cars will go through there. So effectively at some point you reach saturation where this thing where you keep increasing this VDS and current does not change anymore. So that's why this condition here is that VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus V threshold, because that's the point where the highway is full and no one's getting home, basically. Um, so just just that's a way to remember this kind of a, from a physics or intuitive standpoint that what you're really, you are saturating the thing, you're putting so much VDS that it can no longer handle it. And so it has to be great, greater than VGS minus V threshold. Okay, so if you get if you check that those assumptions are correct, if they're all correct, good, you're done. No more solving. Uh, yeah, the yeah. Anyway, now if you're not correct, then uh, you go and you assume now that you're in trial. So in this case, you assume that ID equals uh, k over two vgs minus v threshold times VDS, uh, what is this? Minus one K over two VDS squared. So now you use this equation to basically as your ID, you solve the circuit again, and now you check your assumption, which is that uh, this thing is turned on, meaning that VGS is greater than V threshold, and VDS, and your VDS is less than or equal to VGS minus V threshold. And if that's correct, you're done. And if it's not, then you're at cutoff and ID equals zero. In the exam, and I think all of the questions say this explicitly, but if they don't, assume it's saturation. And if you're not able to get the correct, if you're not able to get that these conditions are met, your answer is wrong uh, because it's gonna be in saturation. Uh, so there's not going to be any trial problems. So just uh, FYI. Um, when we design amplifiers, we design amplifiers so that the transistor is operating in saturation mode. Um, if we don't design them right, then they end up in triode mode. So for the exam purposes, since we're interested in you learning how to design amplifiers for this class, 
everything's just going to be in saturation. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so now let's let's actually try to solve a circuit with the heuristic. Go ahead. Can you get one that's in cut off? Or you can assume it's in saturation. Yeah. But that that's a good idea. Maybe maybe in the final. Um, okay. But hasn't happened yet in the five semesters I thought. Um, I think the yeah th this hasn't happened in the five semesters I thought and so. If you want to check, you can check, but it hasn't happened. Okay, so what you can, so the first thing that you want to basically say is, well, IG equals zero, uh, because that's by definition, no current goes into the gate. And then the second thing you want to do is kind of figure out what kind of transistor this is. And for that, you look for the arrow and the arrow tells you the direction of ID. So it flows flows down. So that means the, the, the convention is defined by the arrow. So this means that down is positive. If the arrow was pointing in the opposite direction, it would be up is positive. So this arrow tells you what's the positive direction. Okay, so the ID flows down, so it's positive down. And where this arrow sits also tells you what this terminal is. So this terminal is actually the source. Okay, so now we kind of know everything we need to know about the circuit. So now we can assume that it's in saturation. And what that tells us is that ID is equal to V, wait, oh God, da, 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 K over two. The reason I write K is because it's either KN or KP depending on the type of transistor, but that's just a parameter of the transistor times VGS minus V threshold or VDS sat and uh, squared. Okay, so we assume this in saturation that tells us this. Well, they also gave us what KN is and they also gave us what V threshold is. So I can just say here that this is just one and I can say here that this is just two. And so that gives me that this is just VGS minus one squared. Okay, so now the, 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 the question now is asking us to basically solve the circuit. I mean, it's asking us for all the voltages and all the currents, which is basically solve the circuit. Okay, I've thought this a lot. And when place people go wrong is they try to do a loop here, a loop here, that's valid. You will get the right answer, but you're also gonna be prone to a lot of algebraic mistakes. Um, and so the easiest thing to do is to recognize that whatever current flows through here has to flow through here. There is no other currents at this node because remember IG equals zero. And so what that means is that the voltage drop from here to here is, sorry, the current flowing from here to here from the top to the bottom is just this voltage minus this voltage, which is zero, divided by the total resistance. That's it. So we're going to say VG, or sorry, uh, I'm just going to call this I. I, I'm going to call IX. IX is equal to five minus zero divided by uh, two, whoa, 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 two plus three capital M ohms. And so what's that? One micro amp. Cool, so now we know the amount of current and then how can we find the voltage at the gate? So there's two ways we can find the voltage at the gate. We start from five, and then we subtract from that Ix times two mega ohm, right? And that's gonna give us Vg. Or we can start from right here, which we have zero volts, and then we add to that three mega ohm times Ix. Does that equation make sense? So basically if there's five volts here, 
the voltage down here is just going to be these five volts minus whatever voltage dropped across this resistor. Done. Or I can say if there's zero volts here, the voltage here will just be the voltage here plus the voltage drop across this resistor, this three mega ohm resistor. So that's what these two equations signify. So now I can say that VG is actually equal to three volts. Okay, we know VG, cool. Um, now that we know VG, what can we do? Plug it in. Uh, yeah, we can plug it in, but now we also need VS, right? Yeah, but in an analogous way, uh, what is VS in terms of ID? Yeah, so basically here we're at zero volts and then we add 1000 times ID. And uh, that's gonna give us VS. Okay, well, hey, I can actually plug this back in. So I can basically say that ID equals uh well two over two they cancel and then we have one thousand id minus wait sorry uh so we have three because that's vg minus one thousand id because that's vs or negative vs uh minus one squared Um, at this point, does anyone know what I can do to find ID? Or actually, uh, other question, can I find ID? Yeah, exactly. Uh, all you got to do now is uh, go to your good old uh, quadratic formula, um, and that's going to be given to you in the exam, and then you're going to get two roots for ID. Now, how do you go from two roots to one root? Yeah, you're gonna get a positive ID and you're gonna get a negative ID, or you might get two positive ones, but remember only one of those IDs is gonna be in saturation and that's the correct one. Uh, because you cannot, you assume that you're in saturation to get that equation to begin with. And so if the ID you solve for is not in saturation, then it's not realistic. Most likely you're gonna get a positive and a negative ID and you just pick the positive one and that's it. And that's both for N type and P type. Always pick the positive because remember that ID is always positive or zero for both of all of these devices. Yeah, so at this point you can actually solve for ID and then you can plug it back in, get your VS, good to go. You already know VG. So now we just need to figure out what VDS is. And in an analogous way, if this is five volts and ID flows through this terminal, what's gonna be VD? Five minus ID. Yeah, five minus ID times 2000. Okay, so once you have ID, you can figure out VD, you can then figure out what VDS is. Once you have VDS, you have VGS, you look at your inequalities and then you determine whether you're in saturation or not. And if you're not, ha ha ha, go and do it again, but now use a different equation for ID. You will have to do that in the homework, but not in a, an exam. Okay, so, uh, wait, why is it asking all these questions? Okay, yeah, this is because I, did all this work already. Now, I, I did want to say something. So in the past, um, there is another way to solve these circuits. You do you. Uh, that's basically the mantra. So I could have also, instead of solving for ID, I could have also said VS over a thousand 
equals three minus Vs minus one squared. And then just solve for Vs. Once I have Vs, I can figure out ID and I can do the whole thing. Uh, sometimes this is more favorable because once you have Vs, you can automatically kind of calculate whether you're in saturation or not without ever even solving for ID. So from a computational standpoint, this is superior. Doesn't really make a difference. You, you do you basically. Um, just do realize that the goal of the thing is the goal of the thing is to you get these really simplistic equations for one for VD, one for VS, one for VG. Once you get those three equations, you take your ID equation and you figure out how to make that into a quadratic equation. And it's going to be either this way or this way. You solve that quadratic equation and then you plug in the unknown to get all your other quantities. That's it. Are there any questions now? No questions. Everything's clear. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, yeah, and just please, no. <laughs> I, I have a I have a method. Trust me. It, it, if you do this, it makes your life simple. You can be zen. You can go watch your basketball games. Like, but otherwise, it you, there's just more room for mistakes. It's not that it's wrong. It's there's well, you can do this whatever way you want. You can actually even make a loop like this. It, it works. It's just that. There's going to be a lot of terms in one equation, and you're going to make a sign mistake, or maybe you won't. I don't wish you the worst, but you're more likely to make one. Just don't make things more complicated than they need to be, and you'll be fine. Okay, so here I just basically plugged in the numbers of what we just went over. So here's three volts, uh, two. Here's VD, which is just five minus 2,000 ID. Vs is just zero plus 1,000 ID. Um, and then once you have these three equations, you can find Vgs by saying Vg minus Vs, which is just this. You can also find Vds by taking this equation and subtracting it from this equation. So you got all the equations you need. You back substitute it into get a quadratic equation. I actually solved it here. So I just basically took this quadratic, expanded it out, and then applied the quadratic formula to figure out that ID is equal to this. So I got either five over two plus minus three halves. So this is what I didn't do in the previous slide because I didn't have any numbers. So at this point I have ID. So now I just need to figure out whether I'm in saturation or not. Before I move to the next slide, this is a mistake that people often make. This circuit is grounded, but if this circuit was connected to negative five, now you're going from negative five to zero. So this thing has to become negative five here. And then VG, since I use the bottom equation, there has to be a negative five here because it's negative five plus the current gets you to VG. So just make sure that you're not taking these equations verbatim. They realize that it's only zero here because this thing is grounded. I, I see this a lot, so just be mindful. Okay, so there's two roots. We're gonna assume one, check whether it's in saturation. If it's not, then we assume the other, check it's in saturation. If it is, we're done. Okay, so first I'm gonna assume that it's eight halves milliamps. So now I can basically figure out what VG is. I can figure out what VS is by plugging in eight over two milliamps, which then just gives me three minus four. So it gives me VGS equals four, three minus four, which equals negative one. Why is it not in saturation? Yeah. 
Yeah, so basically V threshold equals one, and which is uh, clearly greater than negative one. And so we are actually in cutoff. So this current cannot be it because we assume saturation and this current predicts that we're in cutoff. So, nope. All right, so now we basically move on and try the other one. So the, the other root actually turns out to be one milliamp. So then we have VGS is equal to three minus one, which is two, VD equals five minus two, which is three, and VS equals one. Uh, so VGS is two. Uh, so two minus one is equal to one, and VDS is equal to two. So what does that mean? We're in saturation because VDS is greater than VGS minus V threshold. Is that clear? So that means that is our correct current. And now we actually have all of the values we need that we were asked for. So now we've analyzed this circuit. Um, yeah, so I mean, you just go through a few examples. This shouldn't be too hard once you break it down. Um, try a PMOS maybe next time. So that's gonna change the direction of the current. Same analysis process. Of course, now this equation would be zero minus one K ohm. That would be kind of the distinguishing feature because now the current is flowing in the opposite direction, but the, the general process is the same. If you go for these simple one branch equations, I'm telling you it's, it's gonna yeah, just make your life easy. Well, there's also another approach that we're, oh God, this is not good, okay. Um, there's another approach for analyzing these circuits, which is the load line approach. So here, what I have is those one of those VDS ID plots for a given transistor. So basically, this is the data sheet of a transistor, of the transistor. So no matter what we do to this transistor, how we connect resistors, we will never get a voltage that does not sit on these lines, never. Or a current, sorry, a voltage or a current that does not sit on those lines because that's the data sheet of the transistor. That's the IV relationships. That's what we can get. Um, so we can actually leverage that by using what we call the load line approach. So what's the load line approach? Let's, let's ignore this branch for a while. I'm just going to ignore it. I don't even know what RG1 or RG2 is, so I'm just going to ignore it. What is the current flowing through the circuit if the voltage drop across the transistor, VDS, is zero? Wait, the current, the current. So just think about it from the top to the bottom. I have to drop from 10 volts to negative five volts. And I know that the current ID that flows through here is the same current that flows through here. So I'm saying that VDS is zeros, which effectively is kind of like saying this circuit is a short. So how much current flows through this transistor if VDS is zero? Yeah, exactly. 15 over 18.75 K. So the voltage plus minus the voltage minus. So 10 minus minus five divided by, uh, oh, why did I choose these numbers? 18.75 kilo ohm. And I'm going to have to probably go to the next slide. Okay. So, so it turns out that that number is actually 0.8 uh, milliamps. So what that means is that when VDS is zero, what I will get out of the circuit is 0.8 milli. I should, I should check this. Calculator. Fifteen divided by eighteen point seven five equals 0.8. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So that means that 
when VDS is zero, I'm going to get zero volts out of, I'm going to get 0.85 volts, 45 amps of current, milliamps of current out of the circuit. Okay, now we know that. Now, if VDS, now let's assume that, uh, da, 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 da. let's assume that VDS is 15 volts. How much current is flowing through this circuit? Yeah, exactly, because from here to here, there has to be 15 volts, and 15 volts drop through the transistor, so ID must be zero. Now, because these are resistors and they're all linearly related, as it turns out, all you can get out of the circuit is actually this. So basically, um, depending, so once I choose these resistors, depending on what VG is, I will sit on one of these lines. So these are basically uh, the admissible values of VDS and ID. So what does that mean? That if I find out that VGS is uh, two volts, then I can look for the curve where VGS is two, and then I can just read off the graph that this thing will have five milliamps coming out of it. If I figure out that VGS equals uh, 2.25, I will figure out that uh, this is actually 0.7 milliamps. And in what region of operation would I be? Yeah, in the tryout region, because you can see that this point is actually sitting where the current is still in increasing. So that's what we call the load line, effectively. We, we kind of cheat because we know that this device cannot give you anything other than what sits on these curves. And once we fix these resistances in proportion, right? If we say that there's three volts going through here and the same current goes through here, this thing must change linearly because all of these things are linearly related. And so that means that any solution to the circuit has to sit on the line. Uh, and so basically, if you if I give you ID, you can figure out what VGS is. Uh, by simply doing something like this, just looking at the data sheet. So that's what we call the, the load line. Okay. Um, mathematically, uh, so I just gave you the intuitive thing. Mathematically, if you look at these two equations here, so we're going to call this VDD and VSS, we get that VDS equals uh, VDD minus VSS uh, minus RD plus RS ID. Now, remember, these are constant. These are your source, so these are also constant. What is this an equation of? Well, yeah, exactly. This is B, and then this is M, and then this is X. So this is MX plus B equals Y. You can invert the relationship. And so what that tells us is that if we know the values at two points, we can just connect the line, connect the dots, and that's all we got. So that means that this thing has to behave like a line, basically. So this is the mathematical explanation of what I just did in the previous slide and just kind of hand wave through it. Okay. Um, oh God, this is not good. This is not good. Good, good, good. Okay, so let's assume. Okay, so now that we have this load line, let's see how we can use it. So let's say I tell you that ID equals five milliamps, and then it's asking us to find VG, RG one, and RG two. Okay, so if we know that their ID is five milliamps, what does that tell us about, well, for, what does that tell us about VS? Five 
Five. Yeah, so Vs is just going to be minus 5, because remember, this is minus 5, plus uh, 0 0.5 times 7.75. And look, the 1,000 canceled the 1 over 1,000, so that's why I don't put uh, and so that's going to give us a number, which, oh, what did I do to myself? Okay. Uh, okay, so that's going to give us a number, which now I'm going to have to compute because 0.5 times 7.75 equals 3.875 uh, minus 5 equals so th 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 that's going to give us negative 1.125. Okay, so what is VGS? Can anyone figure that out or no? Yeah, so from this graph, we just we know that we can only have uh, answers in this line, in this line. And here is 5 milliamps or 0.5 milliamps. And that process where VGS is two, so now we know that VGS equals two, which is equal to VG minus negative 1.125. So that gives us that uh, VG has to be equal to 3.125. Now we know VG, we simply designed this voltage dividers to give us that voltage. And then we found, so we choose RG1 and RG2 to give us that voltage. Uh, do note that, of course, there's not only one value. You can do this in mega ohms. You can do this in kilo ohms. You can do this in whatever uh, unit you would want, because you just need the proportion to be correct. For designing actual transistor circuits, you have two things kind of a uh, two things that you're fighting against. One is you want a big resistance because that means low current, which means that your circuit will be more efficient. But then you want a small resistance because you want a small package because people like small things and you want to fit more of them. And so you're kind of looking at the two trade-offs. You don't want to spend a lot of energy. You don't want to generate a lot of heat, but at the same time, you also don't want to make this thing huge. So that's how you, in a design situation, would pick these RG1, RG2, kind of considering that those two things. Okay, so that's basically it, uh, load lines. And uh, <laughs> we got two minutes, so I'm going to finish this. I'm going to start this. I'm going to go over this on Monday. Do realize that this will be on your test, so you are responsible for this. Um, that's why I'm just going to start this, and next class I'll finish it. So for this circuit, the first thing is, what is the region of operation? Yeah, so you're going to assume saturation, but if we look at this circuit here, we have that VD equals VG. And then that means that VDS is equal to VGS because we're just subtracting VS from both sides. But then that also means that VDS is less than, or sorry, is greater than VGS minus V threshold, because we just took this thing that was equal and we took one volt away from it. And lo and behold, well, this is the equation for saturation. Of course, we have to assume that VGS is high enough so that this thing is not a cutoff, but that, yeah, because you remember there's another inequality that VGS is greater than, has to be greater than V threshold. So we're assuming that VGS in this case is higher than one volt. Yeah, so this circuit, when we when we do this, when you whenever you see this kind of connection on a circuit, you're just basically forcing your circuit to be in saturation. It's like a trick. You short the, the, the drain and the source, and that forces the circuit to be in saturation. Uh, so you will often see this in circuit diagrams. Next class, we'll finish analyzing this circuit. Um, in the exam review, I went through the circuit already, so you have a way to actually see this over the weekend while you're studying, but I will go over in more detail on Monday. So I already made the exam, so if you don't study this, 
shame on you, basically. All right, see you all later. Quick question. I just feel like the overall process of determining saturation versus cryo versus the cutoff. Like in the example you provided, uh, you uh, use the saturation equation right. first, then check the loop they call drag to make sure that it aligns. Yeah. But this process is like you assume and like you see if it's right or wrong, you really the next mode. That, that makes sense.